Yeah, I think we scared everybody off the front row with our, because we were sitting up there. Thanks, Rachel. We got a uh, Kristen, you want to come join Rachel in the front row? Tom Boyce is in, in the front row. All right. Present. So um, you guys all know Steve, you know Reddit. So I'm not going to give a long intro. We're just going to get right into it. Um, let's see. How, how, how old is Reddit? How many users do you guys have? Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> uh, Reddit is, we just celebrated our, our 11th birthday. And we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 240 million users, depending on how you count. Monthly actives or total? Monthly actives. Monthly yeah. actives. Cool. Okay. And um, I don't know if other people have already heard this story, but yeah, maybe you can talk about some of the early days of Reddit. Like, it's probably a very long story. I've heard you tell it a few times, but um, what were the early days like? Uh, from the uncertainty or like the sure the, the big moments. So there are there are a lot of stories here, and and. If you don't mind, I guess I'll invite everybody to ask questions as we go. Please, yeah. Okay, yeah. So if you have questions as we go, please, you know, jump in because um, there's a lot of a lot of directions we can go. I think. Um, so the context in which we started Reddit was that um, we didn't really know what we were building, and we didn't really know why either. Um, we we were we were in the first class of Y Combinator, but we got accepted through kind of the side door. We had applied with a completely different idea, um, that, an idea that was ultimately rejected. And we're invited back basically because Paul and Jessica liked Alexis and I as like people. And so we sort of brainstorming other things we could work on to be a part of Y Combinator, which at the time, it was the first batch ever, eight startups. Um, <clears throat> and so that's ultimately what led to Reddit. And so our motivation at the time was, uh, I don't want to look stupid in front of Paul Graham. I was a Paul Graham fan. Been there, yeah. And so, so that was, but that was it. It wasn't, you know, let's change the world, let's do all this amazing stuff. It was, okay, they gave us some money, let's try to live up to their expectations, right? They, they invited us back, they took a chance on us, you know, let's see if we can do something cool. So um, because of that, uh, and, and, and then that's, that's the way it was, but I, the advice I would give to people is, like if you're starting a company, you really need to know why you're doing it and, you know, have a set of very high bar for yourselves to get you through the, the difficult times and the, the focus, you know, your decision making and what have you. We didn't really have that. So for better or for worse, we felt like we were just along for the ride. And that's, you know, um, has, has had quite an influence on Reddit over the years, especially in those early years. And you started another company too, Hipmunk, right? When you just started Hipmunk, did you do it totally differently from the beginning or was it another kind of accidental yeah. tinkering moment? No, Hitmonk, so we started Reddit in 2005. I left at the end of 2009 and started Hitmonk in 2010. And we started Hitmonk because my uh, friend, Adam Goldstein, he had lived with me for a little while in San Francisco. He used to hang out at the Reddit offices a lot. He was graduating college. And he basically came to me in the spring of 2010 and said, hey, do you want to do a startup? I was like, yeah, I've been you know, out of Reddit for a few months now. I'm ready to get back in it. Um, would like to work with you. Um, he's like, let's do travel. And I was like, no. You know, why would we choose the most hostile space possible? We have all these like advantages, right? I know the game a little bit. I know investors. I know the press. Um, like we can do anything we want. You know, we don't travel is the last thing I want to do. <laughs> but um, Adam was very persistent. He was the reigning North American debate champion at the time. <laughs> so he tends to win most arguments eventually. Um, and you know, you know, the things that were important to me were when I, when I was leaving Reddit, I had in mind, my next company is going to be involved in the exchange of money. We're not going to contrive a business model. It's going to be a, a, a business from the start. It will have revenue from the start. That was basically, in fact, my only requirement. And um, travel is basically the largest market. Certainly top three, depending on, like, it's, it's, the only mark, it's one of the only markets you can describe with a straight face as being a trillion dollar market, right? Maybe there's finance, um, global real estate, like, the, the travel is massive. So the, the opportunity is there, but um, 
as a company, it seemed very difficult. And so what I told Adam was, all right, we'll do this thing. And in three months, what I want to see is us having legitimate data and users being able to find real flights and pay for them, and then we make money when that happens. If we can't do that in three months, we'll work on something else. And so I said, okay, deal. So about 2.5 months in, we closed that first deal with Orbitz, which got us legit data and um, in their affiliate program, so we could actually have an end-to-end -end business. So that was, that was how we got HitMonCoin. I thought we were gonna fail. But I was like, hey, you know, I'm a professional. I can work hard for three months on something, even if I think it's not, not going to work. Um, and that was my attitude, basically. <laughs> um, so I guess if you think back to like the first four years of Reddit or something like that, um, you know, did you think you were onto something big, or like what percent of the time did you think you were failing versus were you optimistic? Um, I am a natural optimist, so most days. I'm in a good mood and I think we're doing well. Now that said on Reddit, th there are some caveats here. We didn't know what success was. We didn't know whether we were succeeding or failing. We were doing things and once we launched, we started getting users. But one of the big problems of Reddit was because we didn't know what success was, we actually, when we were in a position of succeeding that is like growing pretty quickly, we didn't even appreciate it. Um, we just kind of, we were 21. It was our first thing we had done out of college first web app I'd ever built, I just kind of assumed, okay, you put something online and you get users. That's how it works. You know, it wasn't until we started Hitmonk where I was like, <laughs> no, the natural state is zero users, not, you know, <laughs> not growing, you know, 50% every month or whatever. Um, so uh, in the very, very early days, <clears throat> uh, I definitely suffered from, you know, imposter syndrome. Um, a condition me and everybody I know has suffered from for their entire careers, hopefully, um, certainly me. Uh, so we were, we would just, every day we'd do what we thought was the sensible thing. Um, you know, in the first few weeks, let's just get the damn site online. And after that, it was create a bunch of fake users and submit a bunch of content so it looked like it was working. And then when we had real users, it was, you know, kind of shepherd them and add features and try to make it work better. Interesting. So, okay. I mean, there's so many phases it's gone through at this point. Like, it's become something totally different. Your role has totally changed. Um, I guess let's dive into like one of the later stage issues that might be on people's minds. Like, about you sort of have this big responsibility now of running this massive site where people are, uh, it's changing people's opinions. Like, there's moderation issues or governance and um, maybe, can you talk about like a specific example of like a really tough call you guys have had to make and um, in that category and how'd you do it? Um, this comes up from time to time. Uh, so, so Reddit's evolved a lot, right? The Reddit we know today was not the Reddit we started 11 years ago. Reddit today is many thousands of communities and many millions of users. And those communities are run by moderators and those communities can, you know, represent uh, just about any human interest or geography or a sports team or whatever. Right? We cover, we pretty much cover everything at this point. Um, we often get in these pickles where, you know, we want um, Reddit to be as open as possible. We want everybody to have a home on Reddit, a place where they can be their kind of real true selves in a way that you can't necessarily be anywhere else online or sometimes even in the real world. That, that, is, that is our mission. That's what's truly important to us. Um, but people create communities sometimes that like directly conflict with our like personal values, or in many cases, what I would consider like reasonable universal like values of humanity. Like when you start talking about like racism and things like that, that um, that we, you know, there'll be communities about it. We've we've had communities centered around those sorts of things before, um, and so those are always very difficult decisions. You know, how do we? Um, <clears throat> We, we, would, we would love to say, hey, we want to live in a world where that doesn't exist. And we specifically want to live in a world where that doesn't exist on Reddit. Um, but it is, it is always tricky when you're applying your own morality to, to somebody else. And so we're always walking this very, I think, gray line, a big fat gray line where there's not always a correct answer. Because when you start, for example, if we just ban all of that, well, then you start undermining the openness and people start living in a fear of, okay, um, what, what, what's, what's allowed and what's not. Um, and you say, okay, you say racism's not allowed. 
well, you know, they start getting into what's racism. Like there's, people are very, very good at like towing the line, at making, at making us uncomfortable, at really pushing the boundaries, at finding, you know, um, and, and, and we watch this happen. So we kind of developed this mentality of, you know, what's good for Reddit, the business, what's good for the global Reddit community and try to make decisions that way. Um, and so we've banned some of these communities, like some really nasty ones, and I'm glad we did it. Um, and it created a lot of fallout and, and it really made us think very hard about where do we fit on this, like, you know, what's our role um, in, in, in these debates? Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of our business a little bit actually because Bitcoin is like based on this idea of open money and we have like a high risk business process that a lot of new merchants have to go through. And some of them are doing some things which are like in these gray areas, some of them are like more clearly in the black areas. Um, so we've had a lot of hard decisions to make on that front. Um, Linda, any examples come to mind? I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, well, just a lot of the adult websites. Uh, yeah. The adult websites, like, that's a really big use case for Bitcoin, honestly. And um, it's, you know, how comfortable do we feel? And when we banned adult websites for our banking merchant, th then there's a lot of gray area. Like you were saying, people tell the line, so then they draw pictures. And, you know, it, it really, it's not always clear. Yeah, and, and our feeling is we want people to be able, be able to express themselves. They don't always express themselves in a way that we would like. So where, where we can confidently draw the line is, are you affecting other people in a negative way? Um, you know, first starting on Reddit and then kind of the world in general. Um, so we'll, we, our, our comfort level is kind of a direct result of what is the, the, the harm you're causing. Um, but it is important for people to be able to express themselves because if you, if, you get, if you get too aggressive, then you're throwing a lot of the good out with a little bit of bad. And that's, that's what we're afraid of. Yeah, so actually an example might be close to home for people here is the, uh, the Bitcoin subreddit, which um, we've emailed about this once or twice, but there's a lot of censorship happening in there. Um, and then one of the, the moderators, which I believe it's like your seniority as a moderator is like went by creation date or like he got there first as uh, username is Thamos if you want to ban him. Um, <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't say that, but uh, I mean, that's an example in the Bitcoin community where, um, you know, that basically there's like a rival forum that's come up. But have you ever thought about doing these things like elections for moderators or like, um, yeah. So, yeah, there are a lot of decisions, product decisions that we made um, over the years that, you know, we didn't, we didn't consider at the time the long firm long-term ramifications of them, the moderator hierarchy um, situation, which is one of them. And so we're often in these, in these situations where I'm, we, we see these communities, we see moderators behaving in a way that we wouldn't behave if we were running it. And that kind of go against the, our, our inclination to let things play out and generally be open. Um, and we've seen that on the Bitcoin community. Like, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, but we also, try to put ourselves in a position right now, our opinion is like we generally try to stay hands off unless they're breaking other site-wide rules. <clears throat> that said, we have been putting a lot of thought into these issues. What is the best way to appoint new moderators to remove old ones in a way that the communities can do themselves? Um, you know, other decisions we've made that are, that have had long-term ramifications are the fact that you, the URL um, space is very valuable r slash Bitcoin, it's a, it's a land grab. Whoever got there first gets it. And there's no cost to getting it, right? At least on a domain name, you have to pay for it. But even still, you see this rush. So can we, can we remove some of the value of that? Can we make it easier for new communities to grow? Can we make it easier for communities of users to, um, to revolt and kind of fork a community more easily, you know, instead of, hey, let's all just go here. Um, so there are a lot of things we can do. And this, this is a pretty big area of active research for us of, how do we mitigate some of these issues? Because it comes up time and time again. Yeah, Bology Sven Vossen has like an interesting talk on exit versus voice and how people can exit a community. And anyway, it's an interesting talk if, you're, if you ever watch it. I'll say one thing. Yeah. Um, I, you and I have talked about this before about like kind of Reddit as, you know, what is the appropriate kind of governance metaphor? You know, right now we think of ourselves as the federal government and each community is like a, a state and they generally run it the way they wish. Um, I've actually, interestingly enough, developed a new appreciation and fascination of reading 
history books and war books and like those sorts of things and like trying to draw metaphors of how do I solve problems on Reddit that have like real world metaphors historically. Um, and there's actually been a lot of interesting things in there. So that's kind of the way we've been thinking about it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, so a while ago you guys did, I think this experiment where you were going to like, you take some of the equity of Reddit and you know, grant it to users. And I, I don't think it, it got going, but at that time, um, actually we had a few meetings at the Reddit office to talk with them about, um, putting digital currency essentially uh, as karma points, like maybe every upvote would be one bit. And you know, every three or four months, actually somebody, uh, an entrepreneur kind of tells me this idea that they're, they're gonna do like Reddit, but with digital currency. So if you submit good content, you could earn a living or make a good comment. Um, in fact, at one of our hackathons, I, I, got a, I tried to get a basic version of this working because you guys have an open source code base. Um, I didn't launch it, but... Um, have you guys, yeah, what do you think about that idea? Have you yeah. thought about it more than most people probably? So I still think, um, so the, the idea of giving equity, like <clears throat> ownership of Reddit Inc. to users, um, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, we, we tried and tried and tried. There's just not a, a practical legal way to pull that off. But, um, but what, 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 where, where that idea came from was, can we give value? monetary value back to users who are creating this value for us. Um, and that we very much want to do. We still want to figure that out. Now, as it happens, we're not a profitable company and don't have money to give away. Um, <laughs> but that won't be the case forever. We will at some point. Um, and I would like to figure that out. Um, and cryptocurrencies are a nice way to do that because um, you remove some of the geographical issues. Um, I mean, obviously, you can speak to that a lot better than me. but. Um, I think that that's the obvious improvement, right? And the, the denominations are easier to shift around or you know, more convenient. So we will very likely do that. I mean, we made a promise to our community um, that we would find a way to give value back to them. And we still, we do want to uphold that promise um, when we are in a financial position to do so. Yeah, I mean, you always hear these stories about like PayPal and they kind of got their start on eBay, right? Like that was the first platform that they added value. And like one of the sweet spots of digital currency is real time and global and microtransactions. And it's like the sort of the trifecta of Reddit is like karma points. Like, um, so yeah, if you guys are ever interested in exploring that with digital currency, that'd be something we'd be pretty into. Oh yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll come calling. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're down the block. So, um, okay. So, you know, I don't know if you guys still consider yourself a startup. You probably do. Um, we do. We do. Um, we're 11 years old. I've been back a year. Um, I consider us basically a three-year-old company. Okay. Um, so I was curious, like, um, you know, startups have lots of ups and downs and, and stressful moments. Like, um, what do you do? And probably, you know, as a CEO, you deal with lots of stress, I'm assuming. Um, what? You know, how do you deal with that? You know, like, how, especially for the long term, you know? Um, not just like a short sprint of a year and a half or something. Yeah, what I do is I, I take the stress in and I let it slowly eat me away until there's nothing left. So it's like, <laughs> like just carcass of a human that does CEO things, but I'm really completely dead and emotionless inside. And that's how, that's what you see in front of you today. <laughs> Lots of PTSD. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. No, so <laughs> I mean, as, as I said before, uh, I am, I'm naturally an optimist. So things happen, things happen, right? Shit happens. And the, what I always tell people is some of that is within your control and some of that's not. So the first thing is, what can you do to eliminate the things causing you stress that are within your control? Um, we try to do those things. We treat people right, we pay them fairly. I don't take on uh, extra work that I don't, you know, that I know is going to cause me trouble later. I try to make sure the business isn't taking on that sort of work, you know, hire the right people. There's just lots of things you can do to mitigate stress and risk. <clears throat> so then how do you handle stress that's outside of your control or mistakes you've made? Well, I just think about it. I'm still here today. I'm in a pretty good mood. I have had all sorts of stressful things happen in my life in the last week, in the last day even. But every time I felt like really low and shitty, I've always come out of it. And so whenever I feel really low and shitty, I tell myself, you've always come out of it every point until now. 
what makes you think you're not going to get out of it this time? And that's, that's just how I just cope with it, and I just get back to work, take whatever steps necessary, and lo and behold, so far, many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times, whatever it is, I've gotten out of it so far. So I'm batting a thousand. So that's that's the 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 mindset that I live in generally. Yeah. Actually, it reminds me of like a Paul Graham quote, and I think he said somebody asked him like, "What's the most important trait in a founder or something?" And he's like, "It's not intelligence, you know. It's not like having a good idea or whatever. It was like determination or tenacity. I forget which word he used, but it was basically this idea that like, you just don't stop or you don't give up. So it's kind of interesting." Um, yeah, I know, like, for me, uh, for example, um, you know, like, every year and a half or two years, I kind of, like, hit a point where I'm like, ah, something, something's not quite working. I have to change something, right? I think the first time, you know, like, Fred and I in the early days, it's like, we were often working, like, seven days a week or six days a week, you know, 14 hours. Um, and it was like, you know, believe it or not, shocker, after a year and a half, like, that doesn't... It's not as fun anymore. Um, and so I had to make some big changes. It was like, all right, I'm going to start getting eight hours of sleep. I'm not going to look at work email at all on the, on Saturday or something. Real simple. Okay, cool. And then another year and a half, you know, it's like something's got to change again. All right, like I'm going to force myself to run and like do something physical, like take myself off pager duty. That was, you know, a game changer. <laughs> um, <laughs> go get an executive coach, like whatever. Um, so I feel like for me, every year and a half, two years, it's like you got to stop and be like, what is what is my body telling me? Something's got to change here. Exactly. And I've actually done literally all of those things. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's very important to be proactive about what's going on, what do I have control over, right? Sometimes you just have to work really hard for a while. But almost certainly, if you're building a business for the long term, you know that's not sustainable. Um, so take care of your body, take care of your mind. And, and I always try to encourage people at work to do the same things for themselves, right? I, I'm not working on the weekends uh, generally. Um, I don't, therefore, I don't expect people to pick up the slack and work on the weekends for me. I expect us to organize the business so that we all have a way of relaxing from time to time. Um, you know, I, I, if you say, I don't have an, there are enough, there are not enough hours in the day for me to do my job and five days a week. And I'd say, okay, well, it's time to hire, right? It's not, the answer is not work an extra two days or work 20 hour days. The answer is hire somebody, right? Or let's agree not to do this thing. What are we going to not do today? Like, those are the conversations I want to make sure people are having. Yeah. So um, in a minute, I want to open up the audience questions here. So start to think about uh, what might be helpful for you to ask Steve. Um, I guess one other question I had was, you know, do you guys do uh, OKRs or like goal setting or um, your one-on-ones? Like, what's your kind of quick and dirty management, uh, you know, strategy here? Well, we do OKRs, goal setting, one-on-ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, anything in particular that like maybe the, maybe what do you guys do different or like what's something new you're trying that's like had good results? Um, you know, we've always experimented with processes. Um, I think it's important always that you have, you know, there, there are things that I thought were kind of bullshit, like MBA bullshit, you know, 10 years ago, like mission and values and purposes and all that stuff. Um, it's really important, at least for us, it's really important to think through that stuff, to write it down, to make sure everybody believes it, because um, those are tools for making decisions. And that's how you scale. Um, when, you're, when you're small, when you're only two people, it, it's, it's intuitive, and, and you guys are agreeing on everything. And when you're 10 people, you're probably all in the same room and you can still kind of come to a conclusion and you're making decisions together. But at some point, people have to make decisions independent from one another. Um, and that's when you need things like, uh, what's our mission? What are we trying to accomplish this year? What are we trying to accomplish this quarter? You know, what are we going to do in service of that? Um, what are we not going to do? What are the things we're not going to do in service of that? So being very... Um, proactive and ruthless and disciplined and honest about what gets us to the end goal. And over the years, we've tried many things, many different tactics for where we're going to put our goals in PowerPoints. We're going to use Google Docs. We're going to use tools specifically for goal tracking. Do it every quarter. We're going to do it every six weeks. You know, we, we experiment all those things. And I don't, I don't think there's a, a perfect solution there. I, you know, I always say, you know, look at your business. 
And if it's working, do more of it. If, if it's not, come up with something new. Um, you know, if you're out of ideas, read a book. If you've got an idea, give it a whirl. Like there are no right answers. I don't think there's any wrong answers. It's just important to be flexible and, 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 and proactive. And what is the mission of Reddit? I, I can't remember if you said it earlier. Um, yeah, uh, our mission is to uh, be a place where people can be uh, their full selves, their true selves. Okay. Uh, and then, like, if there's, I don't know, if there's three big initiatives like in, you want to do at Reddit, uh, now that you've been back, what are those? Well, you know, there's, there's okay, so we want to be a place where people, um, we want everybody to have a place where they can be true to themselves, where they can express themselves, all the different facets of their personality. Um, I think that's very, very important. That's a fundamental human desire. Um, what I want to do at Reddit is, I think Reddit is very good at that for many people. I want to bring Reddit to many more people. Um, 200 and some million users now. I think we have a very straightforward, credible path to get to a billion users or more. Right? We haven't even really internationalized. Right? That's like probably 5x right there. Um, now, more tactically, there are things I want to accomplish this year. Right? Our three main company goals are around employee engagement, uh, user engagement, and revenue. Right? And those will probably be company goals for a long time because it pretty much captures up the business. Right? We want to have good people. We want to make enough money to stay in business, to justify ourselves, to pay our people. And user engagement, we want our users to be happy, we want them to be interacting on the site, finding the things they're looking for, you know, building those human bonds. Um, and then below those, you know, each team is in working in service of one or all of those things. And that's pretty much um, how we think of things. Great. Okay, anybody in the audience have a question for Steve? Let's go Tom and then Jeff. Actually, Jeff has a catch box. You go first. Um, I'm curious if you have a favorite subreddit. I do. <laughs> it's like choosing your favorite child. So in this case, my favorite child is right now high quality gifts. Mm. It's really enjoyed. I really like the meta bullshit. Um, prior to that, probably in the meta bullshit territory of circle jerk, I really like that as well. Um, you know, I, it, they, they, they come and go, but for me, the communities that are just like, don't take themselves too seriously and you can relax um, and just like enjoy being around other people, those are my favorites. Nice. All right, Tom. On the uh, community management front, is there any theory that you, like, you thought was true that you really had to change your mind about in a hard way like, as you learned? There are certainly things, okay, so things that I thought were true that we were wrong on. I'll mull that over as we talk and I'll probably come up with a few more. But as I was kind of alluding to before, there are certainly things that I didn't realize were important that are really important. Um, like the moderator hierarchy, that's a big one. Um, who, you know, what, what it takes to grow a community. You know, on, on Reddit, we, we actually are doing a lot of research here. Um, communities grow in lots of different ways. Um, and we've not done a good job at doing that on purpose. We've kind of, we've been very fortunate in that communities have grown and I guess we've made some of the correct decisions to facilitate that. But, um, you know, we, we didn't take seriously, um, this, that's the wrong word. We, 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 like, we didn't get ahead of like the abuse stuff. Like how does the community uh, deal with bad actors um, at scale, right? Everything you do, here's a big lesson. Everything we do, we, we basically, the only way for our, our policies to scale is if the users can do a lot of the enforcing for us. You know, then as we have more users and then therefore more things to enforce, um, that it grows with the user base. Um, there's a number of areas where we didn't put, set that feedback loop up correctly, which creates a big burden on the company. And then if, so the, either, either you have a big burden on the company and you're doing it well, or um, you're not doing it well and then the community suffers as a result. Um, so the whole genre, I think, of, of product decision making that we neglected over the years, that we've been working very hard in the last year to clean up, um, to make sure the, the health of our community and the enforcement of our rules scales with the user base. 
I mean, it reminds me of Bitcoin a little bit in the way that um, Bitcoin relies on, you know, it's a network of untrusted nodes. It relies on at least 51% or more hashing power being good nodes. And it's like in moderation and you're saying, you know, the only way we can scale is our user base. It's like you have to rely on the majority of people being good, <laughs> which in my experience is definitely true. Way more than 51%. Oh, of course. I mean, when I, I think humanity is overwhelmingly good and people are overwhelmingly good and Reddit users and are overwhelmingly good and Bitcoin nodes are overwhelmingly good as well. Um, you just need to make sure you're in a situation where you're taking advantage of that, where you don't let the minority of bad actors um, cause damage. All right, Juan Suarez. I don't know why I like saying full name. I'm, I'm, I'm the only one here. I just like saying it. Th thank you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> I'm sort of curious what you think the damage um, is that would be done. Um, so, you know, it, for us as a financial services firm, right, um, the pressures we have are largely money laundering ones. Um, so that's kind of an obvious thing that we have to backstop against. For Reddit, um, sure, there are things that people could post illegal stuff, child porn on Reddit, you need to backstop against that. Um, but it sounds like you're talking about something beyond that, something else. Sure. And, and so yeah. there are different, you know, what, what are some of the problems we see? What are some of the problems bad actors can cause? Um, so this is the ones you mentioned. Um, there are kind of different scales to this. There is, you know, users who put a bunch of shitty content on our front page for sport. Right? They get highly organized and they do this. And now a, a new user comes to our front page and they see some, you know, ugly stuff and they leave. They don't come back. That's bad for our business. Right now we had an opportunity to, to bring a new user into our community, but they left because they saw something you know, gross or offensive or you know, some, something like that. So in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a big problem for the world, that's a problem for us. Um, problems for the world, that's like bullying. Bullying is a big problem, right? Bullying leads to people, um, you know, self-esteem issues, committing suicide, like real, you can have real world effects on people. Um, it's, a, it's a problem the whole internet faces. Um, but anytime you have private messages, um, anytime you have um, people commenting about potential controversial things, um, you can see that sort of behavior. It's easy online to be an asshole. And so it means there's some, a burden on us. It is our duty to see if we can interrupt, interrupt those exchanges so that people um, are not worse off for it. Um, yeah, more questions. I guess, well, while Michelle's getting a catch box here, um, I've always thought about that. No one's quite cracked the idea of identity on the internet. Um, we struggle often with that, uh, identifying users. But I mean, if people, every comment was tied to like your real identity, I wonder if people would be nicer or if there was like a trust graph. Anyway. Yeah, but Reddit wouldn't work. <laughs> like Reddit, the core of Reddit is the pseudonymity aspect. To yeah. It. The fact that your name has a reputation that is very specifically and deliberately not tied to your real world identity. Right. If you are gay in the Middle East, you could be killed. Um, those people would like to be able to talk to other people about their experience. You can do that on Reddit. It's very, very important. It's very important that that's not tied to your real world identity. So that's what I mean by human connection. Find a place where people can be their true selves. So, but there's two sides of that coin, right? If it's completely anonymous, then there's no incentive to behave correctly. There's no incentive to behave by like kind of common human decency or societal norms. So that's the that's the the area we're always trying to navigate. Can we incentivize people to behave correctly? Can we punish those who are behaving incorrectly? Um, these are not easy issues, but these are the kind of the some of the challenging issues that you know we get to deal with every day. Yeah, for sure, Michelle. Uh, so tagging on to what you were saying earlier, I've noticed like some days you go on the front page and it's all like one political subreddit taking over, like Donald Trump, for example. So I was just wondering what kind of does Reddit see as its view at in politics, whether it's international or, you know. So I fixed that problem personally <laughs> um, about three weeks ago. Um, and the, the, cause we've seen this over and over again. I've had this in the back of my mind for a long time. Um, the old front page algorithm, what you're referring to as a front page are all, which is not actually the front page. Only 4% of our users ever see it anyway. But it happens to be our most engaged 4% of users. Um, yeah, it, uh, would, would get overrun by a, a political candidate. I remember when it was 
you know, hating on Bush. And I remember when I was loving on Obama and then loving on Ron Paul and over the years, like we see this every election year. And when it's not during election years, it's sometimes other stuff. You know, Reddit's faced um, many crises over the years. Um, and sometimes it's humorous takeovers. Uh, but it all comes back to this problem of, you know, we had a, a, a version of our page, which used to be the default and now still exists um, as accessible directly, where just everything's sorted by like basically strict hotness. Um, I changed that like three weeks ago. So that one community, every time a community shows up, um, the hotness of those um, extra posts gets demoted a little bit. So it prevents one community from dominating the entire listing. That's made, it's, it's a very simple change. It's like probably 20 lines. Um, but it's like, you know, the Donald isn't dominating that page anymore. Um, and it's a lot better as a result. Um, now it happens that we're doing a lot of work on our normal front page algorithms and our normal listing algorithms um, right now because I think we can do a much, much smarter job at it. Um, but in the short term, that problem is largely mitigated. It's a lot harder for one group of highly coordinated individuals to mess with everybody else. So I'm pretty happy about that. So if you haven't been back in a couple of weeks, you should <laughs> check it out, it's a lot better. Uh, so you mentioned that pseudonymity is a really important part of Reddit. Um, I'm curious like, if you've looked at behavior of how people choose to act around their pseudonymity, namely like, under what circumstances or how often do people actually reveal like my real name is X or stuff about themselves? And then the second would be like this idea of multiple personalities potentially. Like so how often do you think one person actively uses more than one identity or has like a main and then a bunch of throwaways, stuff like that? So identity is such an interesting thing. Um, it is a high crime on Reddit to reveal somebody else's identity as a bannable offense for life called doxing. Um, now, people can willingly do that, and sometimes you want to. Hey, I'm the author of this comic, right? This is me. Talk to me about it. Um, so I'd actually like to make, I'd like, I'd like to make it easier for people to remain you know, somewhat anonymous, semi-anonymous. And also like it easier for people to grab onto the real world, their real world identity in cases where they need it. Um, those are, I think, both relatively straightforward kind of product improvements we can make. Um, Many users have, we call them alts, right? Multiple personas. Um, you all have multiple personas. Like you're different here at work than you are with your friends, um, than you are with your parents. That's, that's fine. Just like online, you're different when you're, you know, reading about sports and you're different when you're reading about politics and you're different when you're like complaining about Pokemon or whatever. Um, or and you're different when you're like coming out for the first time. Uh, all of those things are really, really important. We, we have not at a product level embraced alts very well, but we at a, at a product level have very deliberately not made it difficult to do so. And, and in fact, what I'd like to do going forward is make it a lot easier to do so. Because um, I'd like, I'd like for, for example, your reputation to be able to move through your persona so, you, you know, so the product works better for you. But um, I, I, I think embracing the fact that you have multiple personas and sometimes temporary personas is really important and a lot of fun. I guess let me maybe ask a more precise question on the second one. So the most common thing I think I see is somebody who has a, a main account that they use the vast majority of the time, and then if they want to do something more controversial, they'll create a throwaway just for that, or they'll build up rep in like a throwaway, but use it explicitly for that purpose. I guess like what percentage of the time do you think people actually actively use multiple personas where it's not intended as a throwaway? They actually like want multiple personalities. Uh, I don't know the number. Um, amongst our core users, um, you know, it's, it's a small percentage. It's, it's alive and healthy. I mean, it's just a lot of work, right? It's, that's, at the end of the day, it's just a lot of work. You gotta log out, log in, kind of deal with this. But at one point in Reddit's history, uh, we used to have this like leaderboard page where you could see the top commenters or top users by Karma over like different time intervals. And of the top 10 users, by overall karma lifetime, four of them were the same person. Um, that guy's still an active user on the site. I'm not going to out him. Uh, I'm not going to out him. But uh, that guy was so fucking funny, and he had these different personas that he like. They all were like different. They had different personalities, um, and he was very like, yeah, I don't really know. Um, 
very internally consistent um, within those personas. So yeah, it can be done, but I think most users probably don't. You know, I have a bunch. You know, I've got Spez, Reddit CEO, and then I've got like my other users where it's just like, <laughs> I just like really want to stomp on somebody. Um, you know, I can get that out of my system. Uh, you know, I definitely have that, so, but everybody has, you know, what are their reasons? Other questions? Yeah, sure. Dan. So there's this website, I forget exactly what it's called. I think it's like Snoop Snow or something. It's actually, like you type in a right username and it analyzes your post history and tells you like a bunch of stuff about the user. So I typed in my own user and it told me I was interested in like these topics and like these, you know, subreddits, et cetera. So that scared me a little bit because it means that I guess like if you have enough topics that a given person is interested in, you could almost tie them to their real world identity and like out their Reddit username, so to speak. I just was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yes, so um, work that <clears throat> uh, we've been talking about a lot is this notion of giving users the ability to um, disconnect from their on-site actions without sacrificing their reputation. Because you could always make a new account or you could delete everything and go away. And users do both of those things and I, both those things are, are negative if that user still wants to participate, right? They built up all this reputation because they're not getting rate limited, people know they're legit, they've been around a while, but they want to disconnect themselves from their common history for whatever reason. Um, I think we should make that a first class ability on Reddit. Um, likewise, as Reddit gets, we start to do more stuff with personalization. Right? As we start to pay more attention to what you're clicking on, what you're not clicking on, you know, in the name of showing you more stuff that you will like, right? that's good for the business, it's good for you. Um, we also want to give users a way to say, hey, forget that. Like, not, not just like, forget it, but like, you know, give you a new user ID so we can't possibly map it back. Um, so. I care, I care very much about, like I wanna, I wanna have my cake and eat it too, right? I wanna be able to track all this really cool stuff because we can do really cool product stuff with it. And I also want users to be comfortable with the fact that if they choose to, they can say goodbye without having to delete everything because that ruins the conversations, right? There's, there's, I hate going to like a thread that's 10 years old where it was like, I remember it was really hilarious at the time, but all I see is like deleted, 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 deleted. Right. Um, I'd love to have those conversations be internally consistent. Um, and so it's something we've been thinking a lot about. So I think it'd be really cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so there's some ad hoc like P2P lending communities that have popped up on Reddit. So I'm kind of curious if you guys have ever faced any sort of like legal liability for that in the sense that like you guys are kind of acting as a financial service provider. Uh, I'm going to pretend I didn't even hear that question. <laughs> Basically, like, our content policy is, is if it's illegal, it's not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, now, we don't know everything that's going on on Reddit at all times. If it's brought to our attention, you know, it's our duty to deal with it. And so if it's illegal, it'll be removed. Um, that would be my answer. Got it. How are you doing on time, by the way? You have three more minutes? Okay. Um, more questions? Jory, oh, Alex, and then Jory. Um, Juan, can you send uh, Jory a catch box? Yeah. Um, do you think sites like Reddit are contributing to the political polarization that we're seeing in the United States? And by that I mean people who spend a lot of their time on a community in Reddit or another social network, and they never experience a, a different point of view that, that's dissimilar to their own and they become very intolerant of others. So <clears throat> I don't think the world would be less intolerant if Reddit didn't exist or less polarized. Um, it is the nature of media um, to polarize. I mean, it, it's, it, that's not their purpose, but the fact that you can choose your friends in real life and choose what you watch on TV and, you know, curate your newsfeed on Facebook and choose which communities you subscribe to on Reddit, people self-select into what they want to hear. So no, I don't think that's a good thing, um, but I don't think Reddit is playing a role on that that is more or less important than anybody else. Is there anything Reddit can do to um, Is there anything Reddit can do? Well, conceptually, so if we agree that that's a big problem, okay, I agree, that's a big problem. The polarization is a big problem. Um, what can we do? I mean, we could force people to see content they don't want to see, but then they're just going to leave, right? People so desperately want to have their views reinforced that they're going to take the path of least resistance to get there. 
So I'm kind of, I'm kind of pessimistic on that topic. It bums me out, right? I don't like it. Um, you know, I, I I I do think it's you know we could probably promote things like Change My View. Right, that's, that's a cool community where you go to change my view and you basically say, I believe this, and people have a civilized debate, you know, it's expressing multiple viewpoints. But the thing is, like, it's such a vanishingly small percentage of humans who opt in to, like, hey, I have enough self-awareness that I might be wrong, right? That doesn't describe a lot of people who hold, like, very strong political or, like, other ideological beliefs. Like, you don't see a lot of Donald Trump supporters thinking, mm, man. Maybe Hillary's right after all. I should just go talk to some other people. That doesn't happen. So I think it's more of a human nature problem. And humans want to be, you know, they want to, humans, okay, I'm not a sociologist, and so I shouldn't even say this shit, but I just feel like humans want to be a part of a tribe, right? You want to have a sense of belonging, and people find that in crazy beliefs. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, I always think it's interesting how. Sometimes companies are an extension of the founders, like the culture of of the company or the community. And I, if I if I were to pair, like imagine the uh, the, the typical redditor is like obviously there's tons of niches, which is the beautiful thing about it. But if you just hit the page and you're not like curating your own subreddits that you really want, you're getting this thing which is kind of I imagine it like a 20 to 30 year old um, white kid in the U.S. who's like you know went to good schools or whatever and is kind of liberal. Is that is that like you and Alexis in a like a caricature of it or something? Um, yeah, you know my political beliefs have changed over the years, and I try to keep them out of the internet and public speaking. But um, uh, you know, Reddit was was built in our own image, right? We sub, we seeded the first few thousand links, right? And we were very active users, and we still are, and we still generally run the site to our own kind of moral compass. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of that does bleed through. Now, the irony, though, is, you know, I may make some claim on Reddit. You know, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to make this feature change. And the user's like, oh, God, you're fucking up Reddit. You don't know what made this thing great. You don't know anything, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, are you serious? <laughs> like, like, we know exactly how this thing works, right? And, like, we have a lot more in common than you think. But it's, it's you know, it's always, those are always amusing conversations. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yeah. Uh, so we use, uh, we kind of monitor Reddit for interactions with our customers. So if they're complaining or if they need help, uh, and we found that the tools for doing that are really poor. Yeah. So Reddit doesn't have any built in and third party vendors don't really supply anything good. So we have all these tool chains linked together to try and provide that. Any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, the Reddit product, the desktop product, has not really changed in a long time. Um, you know, the history of Reddit, uh, you know, we started it without tons of aspirations in 2005. It grew and grew and grew. We sold it in 2006 because, again, we didn't know what we were building or why, so the fact that we are getting any money at all seemed really cool. Um, but we still loved Reddit. We worked on it for another three years. This is Alexis and I. We left in 2009. I started another business. Reddit continues to grow and grow and grow. Product doesn't really change at all. Last year, Reddit was actively committing suicide. Um, that's what led me to return. It's like, hey, I want this thing to exist. I want this thing to live up to its potential. So, when you say actively committing suicide, what do you mean? I've been told I'm not supposed to use that phrase anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, Reddit was in a, in a, in a crisis. Right? The community was in open revolt. They were very upset. Um, and uh, it, 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 there's, you know, Reddit is beholden to its users. And it's... Um, and, and, and if, we, if, we, if we lose their support, you know, we lose Reddit. And that's what I, as a user, I was not at Reddit at the time last summer, that's what I kind of felt like was happening. So I came back. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And our big focus has been, you know, healing and, and hiring and bringing in new people. And we've done a lot of that. Like Reddit, the company now, a year later, is very, very different from where it was last summer. Um, and now we're at a point where we're actually getting quite productive. And we can start making these changes. So yes, the product is lagged, and there are lots of use cases where I think Reddit would be really cool, um, but you kind of have to force it. And, and, there's, and the Reddit's product, in, in many cases, doesn't even live up to the things that we think are like core to Reddit. You know, our moderation tools are not very good. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, you know, another year from now when we've fixed the fundamental issues and we can 
you know, let our engineers say, hey, this use case would be really cool, I'm gonna write that feature. But this community would be like 50% better if it had, you know, this feature. And we can start like tackling these things, biting these things off one by one. Um, I think that'll be a lot of fun. Because I know there's a ton of stuff we can do and we can make Reddit work for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. So I'm very excited about that, but we still have, I think, you know, a ways to go. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, Jory. You kind of mentioned just briefly about because like early in the day, like you guys sold, sold really, really early. And can you like tell a little bit about that, like just the early days and how like the time at con Container Ass like went? Yeah, so Alexis and I started the company summer of 2005. Um, in the fall of 2005, uh, we were joined by Aaron Swartz and Chris Slow. Um, the four of us worked together for a while. Uh, Chris and Alexis are still at Reddit. Um, Aaron committed suicide a couple of years ago. Um, not related to Reddit, but you know, tragedy. Um, but the four of us uh, in the spring of 2006, we were not in a great place. Um, Alexis's mom uh, had cancer. And so Alexis, when he wasn't physically uh, present, was you know, at least mentally, well, how, do, how do I say this? If he was physically present, he was still mentally elsewhere. Um, Chris Lowe was finishing his PhD, so he's really only giving us nighttime hours, working on kind of orthogonal projects. Brilliant guy, but we just weren't getting 100% of them. Uh, Aaron had more or less lost interest in Reddit and was doing other stuff. And so that, that left me as the only guy really working and thinking about Reddit full time, day to day, and I was doing everything I could to basically scale and keep up with spam. So when Conde came calling and said, we want to buy you guys, it seemed very attractive to us because we, we felt like the company was dying internally. And in many respects, it was. Now, we were all 22 at the time. Aaron was younger. I guess Chris Lola, whatever. I was 22 at the time. Um, uh, and so we, we'd never been to an acquisition. Uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, we agreed to a price uh, sometime around, I think, June. Um, it took us forever to close that deal because Conde actually didn't do a bun much corp dev stuff either. Um, during that time, our traffic doubled or tripled. Um, <laughs> the price stayed the same. Um, you know, that's a mistake. Um, but that was the mentality with which we sold the company was, hey, like we are not in a good place. Somebody's going to pay us for this thing that we didn't even really have aspirations for. And like, yeah, let's take this deal. Um, it turned out, um, I think in hindsight, to be a good deal for Reddit. So I don't think uh, Reddit would have survived without that. You know, after I sold, I kind of regretted it. And five years later, I definitely regretted it because Reddit had grown like 100x. And I'm just like, God, fuck me. Um, but uh, the reality is I don't know if we would have survived those five years because we didn't know what we were doing, you know, from a management point of view. The economy was tanking. Um, and so if we had gone the normal route, you know, raise VC money, um, hire, build this thing, you know, then we would have had pressure to like start chasing revenue instead of kind of working on the product. Um, VC, VC money may not have existed because the economy was so bad. It's hard, to, it's really hard to say and, and, and kind of overthink that, but when I look back on it, I think, you know, the Conde years um, were really good. Reddit got to survive. I got to develop as an adult. I got to learn how to manage and navigate kind of big, bigger company bureaucracies. Um, and then when Reddit spun out again, I think ultimately it was in a better place. Um, and this time, it, you know, now that Reddit is an independent company again, can stand on its own. Uh, management knows what they're doing, I think. Um, at least has a better shot at it. And so uh, sometimes those things play out in funny ways, but it's, uh, for us, I think it's been for the best. That's awesome. Well, um, Steve, I uh, really appreciate you sharing everything so candidly with us. And uh, let's all give Steve a round of applause for coming out to speak.